We sing in the name of the good Lord. Although today I'm going to address also people who do not believe in God and who get some pleasure out of criticizing the Bible and especially the God of the Old Testament. So since uh, I have uh, discovered such criticism uh, some time ago, I just want to get some answers from the New Revelation because the New Revelation, as we know, is uh, the purposes of all my videos here. And we are again speaking about this uh, teaching that has been given in the 19th century to two laymen, uh, Jacob Lorber and Gottfried Meyerhofer, between 1840 and 1864, in the case of Jacob Lorber, and 1870-1877, in the case of Gottfried Meyerhofer. And this uh, teaching is um, a revelation obtained through inner word in a prophetic manner, so these people were hearing the dictation inside their own being in the region of the heart, they would hear this sound clearer than anything they could hear around them, and uh, this is what they were doing with witnesses, just writing down the dictation in full lucidity, and these uh, writings have been kept mainly at the Lorber for Life publishing house in Bittigheim, Germany. There are also another couple of other places where the originals are being kept. But anyway, the idea is that uh, there are uh, sources that can be revealed so that people can understand that there are no corrections. And uh, according to the testimony of notable uh, witnesses, there are no sources of uh, inspiration. And that indeed, these uh, messages of an astonishing intellectual quality, giving answers to practically all the fundamental question a person can ask during uh, a lifetime, and uh, also uh, explain the Bible, particularly the Gospels, by um, this fundamental main work called The Great Gospel of John in 11 volumes, the original, but they have also been translated in uh, 25 books, and uh, practically giving again the whole content of the known Bibles plus countless other uh, facts and miracles and revelations in the word of the author of these uh, dictations, who is declared the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what we're speaking about. And uh, yeah, let's note that uh, this teaching has been rejected by all religious authorities since it has been given. Particularly, it has been put uh, at index uh, even in the 19th century by the Vatican. And we can understand very clearly why, why this has happened, just uh, reading the text or having the conclusion given by somebody who has uh, spent time reading them. Because we're speaking here about 10,000 pages, and this is the main work, the Great Gospel of John, that I was uh, mentioning, given to Jacob Lorber, uh, in itself has got more than 7,000 pages. So let's see what people who have tried to read the scriptures, same as I once have when I was uh, a teenager, and their conclusions about it. There are some people who have even been uh, Christians. So this is uh, Nancy O'Brien Simpson, uh, a journalist for Pravda newspaper. And she says, uh, God is the ultimate narcissist. You see, narcissism is about the ego. Only I matter. The God of the Bible and the Quran is sick with ego. Worship me or I will destroy you in hell. I will not read everything. But uh, So human acts of kindness are in the Bible described as filthy rags because the only thing that matters is Right? Uh, it is even worse than this. The Christian God who thinks faith in him is everything posits this. You can rape children, molest them, and cut them up to pieces. But if at the end, meaning at the end of life, you decide you want to worship the Christian God and you are sorry you murdered those children, no problem. Just say you are sorry and worship Jesus and you in heaven. Because faith trumps behavior. And these are a couple of examples. Think about this narcissist of a god. He gets pissed off at the Egyptians. So this is uh, in the scriptures given to Moses. So he is going to teach them a lesson. He sends an angel to slaughter 
all the firstborn children at Passover sick? Or how about when 42 children are out and they see a bowling old guy and they make fun of him? He happened to be God's prophet Elisha or Elijah. So God gets pissed off again and sends two she bears to rip those 42 kids to shreds to teach them a lesson. If you do not so and so, he is going to burn you in hell for all eternity. If that is not the ultimate narcissist, I don't know what it is. And uh, the reality is that the Christians do know these scriptures of the Old Testament, and uh, sometimes they even mention them in the churches, but they don't really understand them. There is, you know, a breath of fresh air when somebody suggests that this is just metaphoric, prophetic uh, speech, but truly they do not understand the real meanings of this. While in the New Revelation, we get a lot of hints in the main books, especially in the Great Gospel of John, but also in Gifts of Heaven, about this prophetic uh, language. And I want to tell you that I have here a brochure I have done, it's now 120 pages, with these explanations of the symbolic images of the Bible as given in the New Revelation. The fact that uh, the scriptures of the Jews are given in a prophetic language is also revealed in the New Testament when it is said the Lord has revealed, has unveiled the scriptures for his disciples. And the Lord also mentions that he speaks in parables, so his disciples will understand, but the other ones will not understand. So even the main thing that he said that managed to alienate his disciples, uh, that they should eat his flesh and drink his blood, can be understood if a knowledge of this uh, prophetic language is given, or if the person has this revealed by the Holy Spirit in uh, their own heart. But um, yeah, there's a lot of revelations here. For example, if we speak about uh, slaying, which we know there's a lot of slaying in, in uh, uh, the Old Testament, there's a lot of apparent uh, cruelty, means judging, you see. But those my enemies who did not want to have me king over them, bring forth and slay them before me, as given in Luke chapter 19, verse 27. And the Lord says in explanations of scriptures, which is one of the books of the New Revelation, this text is almost too easy to give a long explanation for. And it is also one of those about which the disciples did not ask, how shall we understand that? For even the blind Pharisees understood this text the blind Pharisees, so from a spiritual point of view, as they were not able to understand their own scriptures. And they knew that I meant them, them, the Pharisees among the citizens of the city, to be slain. But that would certainly be a narrow sense. Nevertheless, the general is by no means difficult to recognize. One only needs to know that slaying means to judge. So then one already has the whole thing. So to judge according to the word of God. So... Let's go back. There's many, many such uh, concepts that are explained here. And suddenly, the scriptures appears to be, especially the Old Testament, appears to be uh, a fight, another physical fight of the people of God and of the prophets of their leaders, but a spiritual fight for the wisdom of God, for the teaching of God, which had to rule their lives, their personal lives, and their entire society. This in a world which was surrounded by pagan false teachings that were allowed by God to occur with all the other nations. So this uh, satanic pollution was admitted by God as part of the evolution of humanity. But there was uh, a people that was kept by God in order to preserve this uh, true teaching of God his scriptures, and if in the beginning their uh, wise people, their prophets, their patriarchs had the perfect understanding of this metaphoric language, the spiritual language of correspondences, later on this knowledge has been lost in parallel with the moral decline of the leaders of the people and then the people themselves. So yeah, I will just uh, stop this here. And, uh, you know, say that uh, if 
people do not understand this prophetic language, as the Lord says in the New Revelation, they, they would better not to touch it. Everything that uh, is in the words of uh, the old prophets pertains to this uh, symbolic spiritual language. So, for example, everything that happened at the time of Moses, you know, with the plagues sent unto Egypt, which Egypt is a symbol not only of that country, but of everything that is uh, worldly in humanity, these are, these are symbolic uh, trials. So, yeah, I don't want to give my interpretation of this, although there could be things that can be inferred from the concepts given in the New Revelation. But I will say something that is simpler to me, and I can rely more according to my conscience and my love uh, to this. But when Elijah speaks about uh, that encounter with the 42 children that blame him to be bold, concealing that the Lord reveals that uh, here is a symbol of mysticism, you know, of uh, theological, theosophical explanations of the Word of God, which may be derived from uh, sim simple human intellectual insights. So when uh, these so-called children are blaming him for being bold, it could be the fact that there is no apparent personal wisdom, you know, he's naked, he's empty of anything personal, everything he gives to his people and to their authorities is plainly the word of God that sometimes he himself may not understand. So these 42 undeveloped human beings could be even his own critical thoughts and his own selfish thoughts, you know, that obeys him because he doesn't have the right status of a prophet from which the people would expect some personal wisdom. And um, then he he curses, means he, he rejects, he uses his spiritual will to reject these uh, thoughts and he prays to God and God sends the two shebears. So the, the shebears are two forces of nature, two important uh, driving forces inside himself, which of course are the love for God and the love for the fellow man. And these are able, you know, these are able to motivate him to completely tear apart these bad thoughts to clean his soul and his intellect of all this uh, selfish uh, and unfortunate self-criticism uh, and to stay with the proper humility of a true prophet of God. There's a lot of things in the New Revelation about uh, this humility of the true child of God, the very necessary humility of a true prophet or teacher, and the humility in God himself, because this humility doesn't mean that somebody diminishes himself in opposition to what can really be seen. For example, somebody who's uh, more intelligent makes himself more stupid in front of a fellow man. But the right humility is to descend to the level of your fellow man, or in the case of God, of your creation, in order to raise them up to your level, to teach them, to help them develop their own uh, potential, you know, to reach a level for which they need your support. So this is the real meaning of uh, humility, and this is given in the New Revelation also. Once we have this uh, knowledge, and we understand that God doesn't want to take revenge on people, you know, doesn't have an ego to satisfy, but on the contrary, he's very humble, and everything he wants is to help his children, his utmost creation to get closer to him and to evolve spiritually, then everything changes. And I have put here a couple of uh, excerpts from the New Revelation in which the Lord manifests his humble and overwhelming love for us uh, human beings. And here is my favorite uh, quotation where he says, For the sake of one child, I shall sacrifice thousands of millions of sons and worlds of all kinds if I could not otherwise have it come back to me. If, however, it were a question of a child only being saved by my giving this my only eternal life for it, I would rather let this too go from me than lose one of my children. Can you comprehend such love? So this is an address of the Lord to Enoch, 
as given in the first book of the New Revelation, The Household of uh, God, Volume 2, and in the Great Gospel of John, Volume 5, Chapter 157, in the growth of my innumerable, not yet perfected children, in their increasing insight and perfection, and in their actions arising from this, lies also my most sublime joy. Their pleasure at greater perfection achieved with much effort is also my pleasure, says the Lord. And uh, in words of the Father, which is, uh, I think is a compilation from all the works of the new revelation, and none of my earthly children can ever be lost, but all must be saved, whether here or over there. The work on them will never stop, and all the blessedness of my angels consists in only one thing, to help save them. So this speaks about universal salvation and gives the right scale of the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. And one should also know that who died on the cross is indeed God in the flesh, which is recognized today by many evangelical and can be derived from the scriptures themselves. There are many verses pointing to this, and especially the Lord's own recognition that uh, if people want to see the Father, they should just uh, look at Him because uh, the Father is in Him as He is in the Father. So the Son of God, as it is revealed in the New Revelation, is the wisdom of God or the Word of God, the manifest God in the flesh, and um, the Father is the fundamental love in God, the essential being of God. And uh, the Holy Spirit is the power or the active will of God, because whatever the will of this supreme love and wisdom desires is also manifest. So the will and the power are one. So let's see what the Lord spoke to Gottfried Meyerhofer in Secrets of Life, chapter 24, that's life in the light of love. Understand thus my earthly life, and beams of light will envelop you, which you, following my example, can likewise use towards the highest bliss by doing only good, spreading only benefactions, by lifting up your own self and drawing nearer to me. For treading in my footsteps, you are doing the same thing I did and am always doing. In other words, retaining your human and spiritual dignity, you shall rise to that which I want to make you, namely, children of an eternal God and forever loving Father. So, whoever has experienced true love in his or her life knows that this love is a self-giving emotion, that for the lover, the beloved is more important than his own being, and the main purpose of his life is to help the loved one, to preserve its existence, to make him increasingly happier. And this is, uh, this is obviously the position of a righteous, loving parent. And any true parent can understand this. So God came as a manifest father for his children in order for the children to be able to empathize with him. Empathize not, you know, in the frame of an institutionalized religion, but empathize with him in their normal social and family life as fathers, as protectors, as most merciful brothers and friends of their fellow men. And here is, again, this God that some people imagine to be a narcissist wanting to share everything, everything that he has created and all his holy powers with his most, as he says, most lovable children. So this is also from the great gospel of John, meaning is the word of the Lord is given originally to his disciples 2,000 years ago, because that is what we can find in the great gospel of John. We can find, you know, the script, the exact script of many of the Lord's words and uh, people that were around him, also deeds, also miracles, everything that you can find in the known scriptural gospels, plus countless other things that not only explain the scriptures, but explain, as I said, practically everything that has been left unexplained in matters not only of uh, the theological meanings, but in matters of the purpose of life, the spiritual existence, you know, the cosmic creation, even 
the psychological existence of a human being, many, many other facts, including verifiable scientific uh, predictions and revelations. So coming back here, the Lord says, of course, in myself, I am since eternity in the greatest and full joy of supreme happiness, because my love, my wisdom, and my endless great power gives me in, my, in myself eternally the unspeakable, all supreme joy of my godly, in every respect, perfect life. So this is the love speaking about the joys that his thoughts, his supreme thoughts, his wisdom and his power of creation gives him. So from this point of view, God is the one who is the ultimate and main and only, in fact, existence is sufficient unto himself. But despite this, he, as the Father, says to us, whatever I have, my most lovable children must have also. For where on this earth can you find a father who would not like to share all his joy with his children that he loves more than himself, and who finally only experiences the greatest joy after he has gathered his beloved children full of joy around himself? Do you maybe think that a father in heaven experiences less joy about his children who love him above all? Oh, on the contrary, still endlessly much more. But therefore, he also will prepare for them endlessly much greater joy than an earthly father does or can do from the deepest of his heart for his children. For your father in heaven truly has the infinite and eternal most wonderful diversity of means for it. But therefore, do also with pleasure and with great zeal what I as your father have not commanded, but only have advised to you. Then soon you will feel in yourself what kind of reward you can expect. So you see, this is a gentle father. He doesn't order people to do something as, as if they would be animals or machines, because the greatest gift given to a creation that is uh, proceeding to its individualization towards becoming a small God, a child of God, is free will. So God obviously respects this free will, and this is as many Christians do understand today, the cause of all the evil in the world that is allowed, is allowed by God in order to preserve the spiritual entity of even the worst human being, because for all the evils, there is a compensation that God offers on the other side. And by no means the, the Muslims are right when they speak about the victims of hate among them as being uh, martyrs. They are. And God takes care of these martyrs and they are closer to him than anybody else because they have suffered greatly while being innocent and sometimes while, while being very, very loving and good people, especially when we're speaking about the innocent and most loving nature of small children. Again, we are allowed to do whatever we want you know, from our own hearts, and there's a lot of temptations and corruption possible in this world, which is, according to the Lord's uh, disclosures in the New Revelation, the worst possible environment for existence in the entire creation. Just because Satan, as a spirit, is in prison in the core of this uh, natural and spiritual earth, so therefore the the demons are most active and most powerful in their influence towards uh, uh, humans, but this influence is also not uh, possible if the human itself doesn't allow this temptation to happen, doesn't fall, you know, as we can see clearly in the example of Adam and Eve, you know, there is a temptation coming from the selfishness of the body and also from the urge of the mind to contain everything and to rule everything by its own means, which, by the way, are very, very limited because this intellectual mind has been given only as an instrument for the soul and the spirit to be able to evolve and learn in this world. But on, on the other side, it's going to be the spiritual mind that will take over while this uh, intellectual mind will be, if not dissolved into it, practically annihilated. So. Uh, let's go back and say that when the Lord says what kind of reward you can expect, this reward is also perceptible 
in uh, this world because the deeds will bring certain feedbacks even from this uh, lost uh, world. So the Lord says in matters of verifying, validating the truth of the new revelation, my beloved, act accordingly. Only then it will become quite clear to you that this teaching which you have now heard does not come from the mouth of an ordinary man, but truly from the mouth of God, and that it contains the highest and purest truth, and thus life itself, as it is given, you know, in the Gospels, the Lord's words, you will know the tree by the fruit. Yeah, but some may say, well, even so, uh, if God was sufficient to himself, why did he have to create the human uh, puppets for himself to just have fun with them? But look at the answer from the great Gospel of John. However, God did not create human beings as so-called playing dolls for himself, but as completely equal images of him, which he has brought to life out of himself, not as creature of his almighty arbitrariness, but as true children of his eternal fatherly love. And he has given them a creative quality, which is completely equal to him, in order to develop themselves completely freely of, out of their own power of life, according to their own totally free will, until they are completely equal to God. And look, for this reason, the development of man's free will may not be slowed down by any godly force. Meaning, to a certain point, the Lord will never interfere with uh, the human free will, and we are left here in order to, you know, either rise up to an angelic level, or to fall down to a demonic one, everything is possible to us. So because in the New Revelation, everything is about love, charity, mercy, tolerance, which are total opposites to narcissism, the Lord gives us this teaching for everybody, even for people who are of other religions. So let's read this from the household of God. The Lord says, Do you tell my children and all others no matter of what religion, whether Roman, meaning Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Turkish, Brahmin, or benighted heathen, even the atheist, in short, it goes for all. On earth there is only one church, and this is the love for me in my son, in my wisdom. This love is the Holy Spirit within you, which reveals itself to you through my living word. Thus I am in you, and your soul, whose heart is my dwelling place, the heart of the soul, is the sole church on earth. In it alone there is eternal life, and it is the sole redeeming one. Or do you think I am present within the walls, or in the ceremony, or in prayer, or in veneration? Oh no, there you are very much mistaken. There I am nowhere to be found, but only where there is love, there I am also. So you see, there's very many places in the New Revelation where the Lord unveils this essential fact that all institutionalized religion is like a grave for the Lord's true spirit of love that is captive in its real, true scriptures. But this can be liberated just in a human heart. So it's not the temple or the building, but it's the human heart that feels, that has its own understanding, where the truth, the divinity of these scriptures, and with it the whole meaning of life and the destiny of human being is unveiled. So now, this, this is my website about uh, the new revelation. It's just in English. I had one previously, but it has been hacked and destroyed. It was also in Romanian. So here is the page called Support for Christianity that I'm going to address in, a, in another we talk. But uh, the idea is that even for the Gentiles, for the unbelievers, the truth is revealed in their own hearts, and this can be found in the scriptures, even in the Old Testament. So... We can find here, for example, yeah, in Romans, in the letter of Paul for the Roman believers, that uh, indeed when Gentiles who do not have the law, meaning the, the scriptures, the commandments of God, do by nature, and this is not 
of course, the natural body, material nature, but the, the spiritual constitution, what the law of God requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. So they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts either accusing or defending them. Yeah, so the law has been put in every human heart and is manifest through the voice of uh, conscience. Even in Psalms, as David was given, you know, this uh, wonderful uh, words of God, because some people may think uh, he was just a poet, but no, he, he was a prophet. He received his inspiration by the Holy Spirit. And he says, I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is within my heart. So this is before the Lord's redemption of everybody, the people of God, to receive his Holy Spirit in the heart. This is also from another psalm, the mouth of the righteous man, utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not falter because he follows the direction of his own heart, of his own conscience. Isaiah, also the prophet Isaiah, says, Listen to me, that's the Lord speaking, Listen to me, you who know what is right, you people with my law in your hearts. Do not fear the scorn of man. Do not be broken by their insults. Now, so if all the people have the law in the heart, you know, this pure spirit of God, which is confirmed in the New Revelation, everybody has in the heart of the soul this absolutely pure divine spark that has all the love and all the wisdom of God inside it, you know. And this is the true engine of all human existence, be it the soul or the body. Yeah, so this is uh, Jeremiah, speaking about the covenant the Lord God has made with the Jews when taking them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they have broken. So the Lord says, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law in their mind and inscribe it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So this law has been put in the hearts and minds of all the Jewish people at the time. Now, considering what is revealed in the New Revelation, with a spark being put, you know, in every human heart, let's consider that um, this is like a germ, a latent sleeping germ of eternal life. And if this is not awakened by the Word of God, then it is not manifest, it is not manifest even in the voice of uh, conscience. So from this point of view, many so-called Gentiles, due to the depraved education received, the spiritual education in which they are just uh, drugged with lies coming from the originator of these uh, false teachings, they cannot really acknowledge, they cannot really hear this spirit, this Holy Spirit inside of themselves. So that's the role of God's prophecies, you know, to awaken, to make the spirit more manifest. But it doesn't mean that the righteous people among the Gentiles, the people who have come to know love in themselves and let themselves be driven by love and by the voice of conscience, are not following the law. As it is said, they are a law unto themselves. This is uh, reminded by Paul in Hebrews, this covenant of having the law put in the hearts and minds of God's people. Yeah, so that's why when the Lord, it said that we'll judge the people, in fact, we know from him that his own word in the hearts of people, his own spirit will judge them. This is very much explained in the New Revelation as happening on the other side with everybody. So let's say in Romans 2, we find out yeah, about the Gentiles. So, so they, meaning the Gentiles, so they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts either accusing or defending them. On the day when God will judge men's secrets through Christ Jesus as proclaimed by my gospel. 
and then comes the critic of Jew. Now, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? So yeah, this speaks about a righteousness that may be obviously greater among the Gentiles, who from themselves, from their inner spirit of God, are doing the right thing, you know, with love, with the virtues of conscience, while, you know, the ones simply guided in their mind by the law can trespass it, uh, can find ways to trespass it. And in fact, all institutionalized religion is nothing else but uh, a way to do this. A way to strain out a gnat and swallow a camel, as it is uh, said by the Lord, you know, in Matthew 25, I think. So, so again, coming back to these uh, people who are doubting the goodness and the humility and the perfect fatherhood of God, this is due to real uh, issues with the um, comprehending of uh, the Old Testament. And unfortunately, the actual uh, Christians cannot really explain them. So they try to make a sort of a compromise between the Old Testament and the New Testament, in which uh, they have a God of love in the New Testament, especially manifest in Jesus, and uh, a God of uh, justice manifest in the Old Testament. But um, again, the new revelation is necessary. The good Lord has given us uh, these uh, scriptures, these pure scriptures that have been in reality predicted even in the Old Testament. And I have this uh, study here called The Strong Link Between the Bible and the New Revelation. So you can get here and find verses in the Bible pointing to a new teaching from God in relationship uh, to the Second Coming. So, yeah, this teaching has been predicted. It's very necessary because Christianity, first and foremost, cannot defend herself without the true knowledge of their own scriptures, especially in these times in which, for now, a more covert uh, Armageddon is uh, unfolding. But in fact, uh, the war against the Lord, and particularly Christianity, is uh, going to get really hot soon. So, yeah, there are answers. And some of these uh, people that have uh, discussed this issue are obviously very good people that want to meet a God of love, a God that is understandable, that they can really follow with their heart and their conscience. And this is the God that you can find in the New Revelation and demonstrably is the same God, the same Jesus, and the same scripture as we have in the Bible. So for whomever wants to get a proof of this, or whomever wants to get a bit more taste about what a new revelation is uh, giving in comparison to other religions or branches of uh, Christianity, I have here a list, a spreadsheet even, in which we can find the main traits or tenets of the new revelation in comparison to other religions. Of course, everything is uh, disputable because it's the result of my own readings and uh, experience. But uh, I'm very much sure that what I have put here on the column of the new revelation is quite uh, reliable. So what we have in the new revelation is uh, a religion in which there is no cult of relics or iconolatry, no ceremonials, no need for priests or saints or, or any other created beings' intercession. Everything is between the human heart and the Creator, God. Salvation, as we have seen before, is possible for people outside the denomination, exactly because the law is in the heart and minds of people. And an awakening is possible on the other side too, which is rejected by most of the Christians. The Bible is the true Word of God, very much confirmed here, though there are some problems with uh, translations, 
that are explained, especially in the uh, gifts of heaven. The most reliable Gospels are the Gospel of Matthew and uh, the Gospel of John, that is really, the denied by many today, is really the one that the dearest uh, disciple of the Lord has written himself. The Church is the fellowship of the believers, while the temple, the building, uh, and its organization have no importance. There is only one God, attention Muslims, there is only one God who is eternal love. However, this God is also a trinity, meaning one being with three fundamental aspects of manifestation. Same as us, as comprehended by all these religions, are a body, a soul, and a spirit, and still one, one only. But as we know, we are created in the image and resemblance of God, so we can understand God is triune also. Jesus is the only God incarnated, manifesting the flesh, the creative word born of a virgin. Jesus is the Savior. He teached and done miracles, died on the cross, and by this he atoned for the sins of humanity. By the way, speaking about his atonement and his death and his resurrection that I have not mentioned here, that's a great mistake, let's remember that the Shroud of Turin is a great proof of the miracle of the resurrection of uh, the Lord. And there's a lot of scientific uh, testimonies about this. Uh, you can find them on uh, YouTube, just look for the Shroud of Turin. A lot of research done with the most modern means of investigation proving that what happened there with the body was indeed uh, an extraordinary manifestation of uh, energy that uh, dissolved the body in an instant. Main commandments in the New Revelation are same as in the Bible, our love for God and the fellow man. The Ten Commandments are also explained from a spiritual perspective, even from several spiritual perspectives. The reborn in spirit, the people who are reborn in spirit, are the ones perfected in the love for God and fellow man, and in humility, because Jesus the Lord expresses the ultimate humility of God, and I have tried in my poor words to explain what this humility really means before. Earthly humans are created to become children of God, which is the highest rank in creation above the angels, you know. Of course, there's no known moral ethic issues of the prophets or apostles used by God in establishing the church, and this includes Jacob Lorber and Gottfried Meyerhofer, not to mention Jesus and apostles that are also uh, considered by, of course, all the branches of Christianity. There is a doctrine of sin. Uh, there is heaven and hell in the afterlife, although hell has not been created by God, but it's just this certain place in the astral world where the evil persons are gathering together and is separated from heaven, you know, due to the will of God. There is an emphasis on absolutely all moral values and the fundamental equality of all people, I mean, all created people, is preached and explained. There is a promotion of chastity outside of marriage and inside, except uh, for the purposes of procreation. Immortality of human soul and universal salvation are explained. As I said, hell is a creation of sinners. It's not forever, it's like a mental prison if you want, but it depends on the sinner's free will which is obviously preserved in the afterlife, because without the free will, there's no human being anymore. Uh, and it's funny that very many Christians deny the sinners in you know, the afterlife any kind of free will. In other words, they turn them into machines or uh, into animals. And then the, the so-called punishment of God has no significance anymore, because they, as humans, have been annihilated. Anyway, so these are basic logical issues that the Christians cannot deal with. But God's judgment in itself, it's also love. Thus has always a constructive goal. In uh, the childhood of Jesus, the Lord, as a child, says to his mother Mary that in his wrath, it's infinitely more love than in her love for himself. That's just an example. God doesn't personally punish people. But people bring all the misery and suffering upon themselves by misusing their free will, you know, by causing evil unto each other and to nature itself. 
many Christians do understand this, but they also, because they do not understand the old scriptures, the Old Testament, they also consider that God personally punishes uh, people, you know, when he gets too upset. While in New Revelation, we understand that nobody, absolutely nobody can offend this God of mercy and love. But we, by sinning, are offending ourselves, are offending our own spiritually created nature and dignity. There is a confirmation in the New Revelation and explanation of previous scriptures. There is an explanation of spiritual world in great depth in many volumes that you cannot find in any other purely religious literature of the world. Maybe except, you know, some theosophy or anthroposophy, but not in any of the big religions. There is an explanation of natural world from a purely spiritual perspective, which it's even lacking in the ones that I have uh, mentioned. Although there is more in anthroposophy, which I speak about the revelations of uh, Rudolf Steiner, but they diverge very much at a certain point from this uh, revelation uh, through Jacob Lorber and Gottfried Markov. There are exact scientific and technological facts and predictions. That's for another presentation. Hopefully I will be able to do this. And these are not to be encountered in <laughs> absolutely any other religion or um, spiritual uh, school. There is a huge compatibility with uh, paranormal research, I mean, honest uh, research in this uh, paranormal field, especially in matters of um, spiritual manifestations uh, or powers of the spirit, you know, that are uh, manifest even in this uh, natural life. There are prophecies concerning the second coming. Some of them we see happening uh, before our eyes. And I said here, I'm not invalidated because many other Christian schools like Adventism, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormons have their own prophecies from the 19th century, but uh, they have been invalidated. This is not the case with the new revelation. So, yeah, you, you can find here this uh, situation, but uh, in matters of conformity with this law written in the heart, you know, the common sense of love and conscience, I don't think you can ever find something more compatible than the new revelation. I have even heard people saying that this is too much common sense to be sent by God, you know. So I believe that people who have issues with the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, be they believers or non-believers, may really find all their questions and problems uh, solved in the new revelation as it was my case but anyway returning to our main issues of god being a narcissist and uh, a cruel judge of uh, human beings yeah i think uh, we are very very far from this in reality and the true narcissist is of course uh, Satan, the one who opposed God and the order of divine love, and who wanted everything for himself, not having any other way but by lying, stealing, and destroying. And uh, of course, all the people who are following the path of uh, selfishness, which is unfortunately our fallen nature. We can observe this since uh, early childhood, but we are here in order to awaken in ourselves this uh, spirit of uh, true love and compassion and tolerance. And the new revelation has been given exactly for that, as a wonderful means to nourish this uh, eternal spirit of love from the human heart, and also as an incredible weapon on the side of uh, spiritual truth in the end time battle, also called Armageddon. So thank you very much for listening to this uh, presentation. May God bless you all, believers or unbelievers, and may the truth in your conscience and the goodness and love in your heart guide you and give you the true answer about the validity of the new revelation.